Hello and a warm welcome to everyone joining this session today. We have Michael Pilquist with us today to share his experience uh, building the functional streams for Scala. Uh, he'll be talking about FS2 chunks. The chunk data structure powers uh, the functional streams for Scala stream library. And we have uh, Michael who will be taking us through the design of chunk and in particular, uh, or he'll be explaining the design constraints that guided its ev ev evolution. So I'm pretty much excited for the talk. So without any further ado, let's head over to Michael. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. So yeah, I'm here today to talk about the FS2 library and particularly the chunk data type. Uh, for the folks that don't know me, uh, Michael Pilquist, I have been with uh, Comcast for about 17 years where um, I've had a, a, a career that sort of started with um, C and C++ and went through a, a Java sort of enterprise phase. And then for, the, um, for about the last decade, I've been heavily involved in functional programming. Uh, I maintain a bunch of functional libraries in the open source ecosystem, um, in particular the FS2 library, as well as things like S codec uh, and a couple others. Um, normally when I give a talk on FS2, I kind of get into the, the internals of the streaming approach or some of the novel ways we do concurrency. Um, but what I really like about today's talk <clears throat> is that it shows that there's still really interesting problems to solve with sort of simple data types, with um, data types that um, maybe don't attempt to, uh, you know, boil the ocean with, with um, uh, their capabilities. <clears throat> so <clears throat> with FS2, um, we have this chunk data type. And the chunk is a collection. And if we look at the Scala doc of the chunk data type, we end up with a definition that looks somewhat like this. It says that a chunk is an immutable, strict, and finite sequence of values, and that it supports efficient index-based random access of elements. Okay. The problem is that in Scala, we already have a data type that meets these uh, constraints. We have the persistent vector a data type. Uh, persistent vector is immutable, it's strict, right? It doesn't delay computation in any way. Um, it's finite, it doesn't allow, you know, infinite um, values to be represented. Uh, and it supports, you know, effective constant time indexing. So maybe the first question to ask about the FS2 chunk type is why does it exist at all? Why aren't we just using the vector type in the library? Um, and so to, to understand that, we have to look at some of the APIs that get built with the FS2 stream data type. So here I have two sort of example capability traits. Maybe there's a trait that represents um, reading bytes from like a network socket in some effect F. Um, so here this socket you know, has a reads operation that returns a byte stream, a byte stream that evaluates a, a you know, a, um, you know, that evaluates uh, values of a given effect. So like if our effect type here was IO, then um, in order to generate that byte stream, it's going to uh, invoke IO computations. And likewise, you know, you can imagine a files <clears throat> API, right? To read all of the bytes from a file on the file system. And again, streaming those bytes back by evaluating uh, some arbitrary effect. So these are both very common signatures that you see in the FS2 library. And all of the operations on our stream data type let us manipulate values of the output type of the stream, right? So here we have a stream of bytes. So if we were to like filter over the stream, we'd be filtering out individual bytes. Or if we were to map over the stream, we'd be, be transforming individual bytes. But internally, that would not be an efficient way to represent a stream data type. Um, just all of the sort of machinery involved in the streaming approach uh, sort of adds up if we're manipulating individual pieces, individual um, you know, values in the stream. So rather, we move stuff around 
in the stream as chunks, as these densely packed, you know, maybe arrays of bytes you can imagine, right? Move those around, but then the API lets you sort of ignore the fact that these chunks exist and operate on individual elements. Now, why not use vector instead of using chunk uh, to move around those um, densely packed sets of bytes? And there's a bunch of reasons. We're going to walk through them. But one of the key ones we can see right away, just by looking at these two sample APIs, is that if we tried to use vectors, then we're going to have to do a lot of copying. Right? Like you can imagine a socket API that's interfacing with the operating system, um, maybe providing you know, byte arrays directly, or maybe having, uh, you know, directly allocated byte buffers that, you know, sort of the network uh, API is, is putting data into for us. And so we want, we want to be able to, um, to be efficient if we're using this for um, IO. But before we even get into the details on, um, on copying, it's worth pointing out that uh, vector really the, the, the thing that caused us to first move away from vector years and years ago um, is that vector is not particularly space efficient. Uh, so here, you know, from left to right in this table, we have the size of the collection. And from top to bottom, we have a bunch of different types. And so in Scala 2.12, you can see the overhead of vector was pretty, pretty big. Uh, an empty vector was 56 bytes up through a vector of 10,000 elements being, you know, 47,000 bytes. Um, in 2.13, Scala 2.13, vector was rewritten, um, thanks to Stefan Ziegler and, and uh, a few other folks. The 2.13 vector is significantly better. And in particular, um, small vectors are, are much smaller, right? Vectors with few number of elements take up much less um, Heap space. But even with the uh, improvements in the 213 vector, you can still see, like if we wanted to actually store bytes in a vector, the overhead you know, is still significant. Um, and that's because vector is not specialized on the byte data type. And so every byte we put into a vector actually gets boxed, right? So we actually store object references to individual bytes, pretty, pretty inefficient. Um, now, Moving arrays around would be sort of the best we could do. But if we moved arrays around, we have to deal with the mutability of arrays. And this is a functional programming conference. Um, so chunk is, uh, is our first reaction to that. Chunk gives us a way to have the efficiency of arrays, but be immutable. You can sort of think of it as an immutable array. So we can alter the definition of chunk a bit. We can say a chunk is not only an immutable strict finite sequence um, that supports efficient lookup, but we want it to be memory efficient for all sizes, for small chunks, for large chunks, et cetera. And we want to avoid copying as much as possible, right? Interfacing with those IO boundaries. <clears throat> so let's walk through those constraints and see how they manifest in Scala. So we say a chunk is finite. So you can imagine that uh, a, a trait here called chunk that stores values of type A, and it has a size. The size will be an integer. We don't need to worry about representing um, sizes as longs, right? Because FS2 is a streaming library. So uh, you know, if, you, if you have a chunk that's larger than, than um, a signed int, then you can just use two chunks and manipulate them together through a stream. So a chunk is finite. Um, we want this efficient random access. And so we have this apply operation that you, know, you pass an, an index and you get back the value at that index. And right away, you know, we've only added the second method to our data type here. Right away, we have made a trade-off. Um, in this case, we are trading off the safety of making this method total, right? Um, like, we could pass a negative one, we could pass an index out of bounds. Um, rather than getting back an option or getting back some type of, of uh, safe value that prevents that, we're going to throw an exception. We'll throw an index out of bounds exception. And we're going to do that specifically because of the need for efficient random access. Um, if 
someone's writing an algorithm that's sort of traversing through different indexes of a chunk, chances are they're going to be doing a lot of those, right? Um, jumping around, uh, you know, pulling out different um, or different values, of different indices, et cetera. And so we don't want to pay that boxing cost of um, wrapping those values in option. Um, we want to avoid copying and making sure uh, we have these memory efficient implementations. And so here's like three da um, data constructors for the chunk trait that we um, just created. There's an empty data constructor, which actually uh, caches that value off as a value. Um, you know, um, the, the type of this value is actually a chunk of nothing, indicating that it's a, it's a uh, chunk of any type, right? And chunk is covariant in its only type parameter. Um, we have a singleton chunk where uh, it just wraps a single value. So the only overhead we pay for that uh, singleton chunk from a, a heap perspective is the single object reference uh, as, as well as the uh, size of the object we're pointing to. And then finally, we have an array constructor, which just sort of lifts an immutable array. And again, you know, we've made another concession, right? <clears throat> the safest implementation of this array data constructor would do a defensive copy of this mutable array. So you could argue, is chunk really immutable even now, um, given that it has this data constructor that can reference mutable arrays in which post-construction, someone could go and manipulate that underlying array. Um, and we would, uh, you know, in essence, break our immutability promise. And then we have a bunch of other more specialized data constructors. So here's uh, two example ones you could, you could come up with. Um, there's an index seek data type in the Scala collections library, which is basically a immutable sequence that has a fast um, indexing uh, lookup operator. So we can lift those right into chunk. Um, and you know, because we work with byte streams a lot, it's often or, or it's probably convenient to have a way to interoperate with like the Java Nio byte buffer uh, interface, right? And once again, uh, we don't do defensive copies of those underlying buffers. Okay. Um, so we've avoided copies in our data constructors, but how about the operations on our data type itself? You can imagine some code like this. We have some huge chunk of bytes that we got from somewhere, it doesn't really matter. And then maybe we've got some algorithm that wants to take that huge chunk and, and take the you know, first 10 elements and process them and then maybe delay the processing of the remainder, right? Maybe it's like a binary parsing protocol or something. <clears throat> One way we can make that more efficient right off the bat is by thinking about the operations that we're providing to our clients, right? So rather than having a take and a drop, maybe in this case, it'd be better to offer a split at, right? Just to um, have that knowledge in the implementation of split at that we, we need both pieces, right? We can avoid some, some duplicate work if we know the client wants both a prefix and a suffix. Okay, so how can we make split at efficient? Right, a, a naive implementation of it, maybe would have to pattern match on all of the data constructors we've defined so far, um, and then handle like array copying, byte buffer copying, et cetera, um, you know, and, and generate uh, duplicate arrays. We don't wanna do that. So instead, um, we can introduce a new data constructor. In particular, or the array slice data constructor, holds a reference to an underlying array, but then also holds a view, a subset view on that array. And that view is identified by an offset into the, the wrapped array, and then a, a number of bytes from that point forward, or another, a number of uh, values from that point forward, right? The apply operation we've written uh, before is just normal index-based lookup, just you know, adjusting for the offset and the size. And then split at, we can implement in a way that uh, is zero copy. Right? Split at can say, um, in essence, just create two views of our underlying array and just do some 
offset arithmetic. Now, we've given up a little bit of strictness in this case, right? Um, when you call split at, the API makes it look like, like you know, when we said split at 10, the API made it look like we had a small prefix and a large suffix. Um, but if you know, we, we are relying on that small prefix, like we, we wanna uh, accumulate a lot of these small prefixes, um, we have to be careful that we're really referencing like huge underlying uh, arrays beneath that, right? Um, so we're trading it off again, you know, the, the initial constraints we put in place. Um, we're giving up a little bit of strictness, uh, in this case for performance um, and efficiency of the split out operation. Okay, let's, let's add some combinators to our data type. So maybe the first combinator we might add is a for each, a side affecting for each operation, right? Apply this function to every element in the chunk um, and just perform some side effect. And since we have uh, a finite size and we have an efficient apply operation, then this is really just a while loop, right? We start at index zero and just rip through um, all of the elements of the chunk uh, calling our function f. Likewise, we can do side affecting with an index, right? Um, for each with index, basically the same exact implementation. We're just passing that index into our uh, function that's passed to us. So far, so good. Um, but this is again a functional programming conference. So let's let's look at more functional combinators. How about map? Uh, we want to map a function. Um, F over our chunk, right? Transforming each individual element. So how might we go about implementing map given our definitions so far? So maybe a, um, a first take at the implementation of map could look something like this. Uh, we can un, uh, create an array of our target type B. And now we know the size of that array because map's not gonna alter the structure of our chunk at all, right? Um, so we, we allocate an array of that size. And then maybe with for each with index, we just side effect um, you know, array mutations through all of the indexes of our source. And then we return uh, an immutable chunk referencing this brand new array we just created. But this is not going to work in Scala. Uh, and in particular, we need, we need this thing called a uh, class tag from the Scala reflection library to be able to allocate an array of a polymorphic type B, right? We can't just create an array of, of any type in Scala as a result of running on the JVM and as a result of the JVM having uh, primitive array types built in, right? So if someone was to instantiate this map operation with B equal to byte, for example, we want a primitive byte array created on the JVM. We don't want like an object array where the individual bytes get boxed. So we can't, um, we can't quite write this code the way it is here. Um, so one, op or, or one option to address this is to add that class tag constraint. Um, so here we've added this uh, constraint to the type parameter B on map. And I, I changed the name to map compact now. Um, that class tag uh, basically acts as a witness that we're able to in, uh, create these primitive arrays, right? So if B ends up being a primitive JVM type, we get a primitive array of the corresponding uh, type. Um, and if B ends up being like an object type, we're just gonna get a regular object array. So this is fine, this works, there's no problems here, um, but it doesn't really scale. Right, like this, this works fine for this one operation map, but really do we want these class tag constraints propagating through all of our APIs on chunk um, as we you know, continually run into operations that maybe need to allocate you know, new chunks. Um, furthermore, the definition there is interesting, but it's, it's not as performant as it may look. Like we want, we want these primitive uh, byte arrays to be created on the heap, um, but we had a function argument, 
And that function argument said, you know, map, for example, a byte to a byte or map a int to a byte, you know, and so forth. Um, the function trait that's used in Scala to sort of implement um, function values is specialized on some primitives, but not all. And in particular, it's not specialized on byte. Uh, so even if we're mapping a, a chunk of byte to another chunk of byte, each of those bytes will get boxed, uh, passed to the function one, and then the returned, the, the resulting byte, will then have to be unboxed. Um, so there's tons of boxing going on, even though we thought you know, we were working with these densely packed byte arrays. Um, like I mentioned, these class tag constraints virally propagate, right? Anyone that wants to call a map compact in a generic context, right, where they don't have a concrete uh, known type, are going to need to pick up that same class type constraint, and they'll continue to propagate until um, until it reaches a, a concrete case. <laughs> and you know, and then furthermore, we end up with um, with different implementations um, if we if we implement map compact, where we maybe have like an efficient version in the compact case and an inefficient or maybe it doesn't, doesn't normally matter, right? Or a default implementation in the non-compacting case. And if we were to really offer both of those APIs, then we're making our users of our library pick in each case, which one to use. And it's just too much of a burden on everyone to pick constantly all of the time, right? So map compact isn't really a great solution. So instead, um, we can take some of these facts and put them together and say, well, we're going to end up boxing here anyway, right? <laughs> like, I, like I mentioned, the, the bytes sort of flowing through this function one are going to end up getting boxed as a result of just Scala not specializing functions for bytes. And so really, we don't, in, in this case, we don't necessarily need a primitive array underneath. So we can construct an array of any. And this will really be in a, an array of object references on the heap, right? So this is not space efficient. Um, furthermore, it's unsound, right? Like we have an array of any and we're claiming, you know, or, or we're sort of trying to treat that as an array of type B. Um, and that's, that's not a safe thing to do. So in this case, uh, we can work around it. This is the same trick that's used in the Scala collections library internally in a bunch of similar cases. Um, we end up creating these array of any's, but as long as we never reference that array of any as an array of B, then it's okay, then it's safe. And in this particular case, we never expose this underlying array, right? We're constructing it locally and then encapsulating it and keeping that array private. Right? There's no way to access it. Um, so in this case, even though the, the operation is unsound, overall, uh, it is a safe operation. OK. So what about compacting? What about when we really want those densely packed byte arrays on the heap? Um, well, in, in those cases, we can just ask for it. Right? We can keep our operations, perhaps, um, inefficient. That we just um, from a space perspective, like we just saw, um, and just add uh, compacting as a separate operation. And so in this case, we've added two operations to chunk, two array, which just copies all of the elements into a brand new array. Um, and in this case, this two array will have a class tag constraint, right? Because from an API perspective, we're saying this is going to allocate a primitive array. And then likewise, compact just does the chunk wrapper around a call to two array. And in reality, in the library, the implementation of these type of operations is a, you know, a bit more complex, significantly more complex, because we have all sorts of special cases to avoid these copies when possible. Um, or in the case of like underlying array slices, we can implement two array by actually doing like a native array copy of just the part of the, you know, the slice of the array that we care about. Um, but all of these same constraints and trade-offs that we just made still apply even in the optimized cases of these operations. 
All right, let's look at another one. Um, filter operation, just like map. Uh, but this time, we don't know the size of the elements. Um, so we can't just construct an array of the same size as the starting chunk, right? So here, we lean on the Scala Collections Library again, and we use an immutable array builder. And the mutable array builder in the Collections Library is very much like a Java array list, right? It will, um, it, it basically has some algorithm to uh, resize periodically by factors of two. Um, we run into the same problem though, with respect to class tags. So again, we'll, in this case, uh, create an array builder of type any, knowing that that's gonna, uh, you know, in the end, give us an array of object references. Um, and then we're going to, uh, do that same unsound cast that we did before. One thing that's kind of interesting here is that we can choose to do size hinting to the array builder. And so the question is like, if we have a huge chunk and someone calls filter on it, is it more likely that they end up with a chunk that, you know, is near the size of the input chunk? Or is it more likely they end up with a chunk that's that's near empty? And of course, there's no way to imp or to answer that question in a totally generic sense, right? But in a data type that's in a streaming library that met much of the time works with bytes, we can use that context to make a better um, implementation here. And so here we we choose to say, you know what? We think most of the time when, when folks use filter, they're going to keep elements in. And so we're going to size hint the underlying um, array builder towards the size of the, the input collection. And of course, that will be the absolute wrong decision sometimes, right? Like if you filter all elements out. Um, but in practice, I think it ends up working out for our use cases. OK, so let's take a look at this next example. We've got a huge. Um, chunk of bytes again. And then we've got a tiny little chunk of bytes, right? A carriage return line feed, which just is, is um, you know, a two byte array perhaps. And um, we have two examples of how those two chunks may be combined into a string, right? So in the discouraged case, uh, we lift a single chunk into the stream API and we, um, the, the, the chunk that we lift is the result of concatenating the huge chunk with the little chunk. And we want to discourage that because we don't want to do any copying, right? We don't want this plus plus operation to, to sort of have to do a whole big array copy, right? That huge array plus two more bytes on the end just to stick those elements there. Rather, we want folks to use this encouraged example, right? Of, there's no need to create a single chunk representing each of those two constituents because with the stream API, you can just lift both chunks and concatenate those streams. And that's actually constant time in FS2. So the question is like from an API perspective, how can we encourage folks to do the, the latter? Um, and, and the answer really is that, you know, when we write software, we tend to uh, be lazy about, um, about things, right? We want our APIs to be elegant and simple and not have a lot of cruft. And so in this case, we discourage it by just not offering the API, by saying like, hey, if you wanna, if you wanna concatenate two chunks, then we're gonna kind of make it ugly, right? Um, we're gonna make you kind of put those chunks that you wanna concatenate into a list and then call this concat function, right? And this is sort of just a speed bump. It's, it's just as expressive as the previous example, but this speed bump, making it just a little bit more inaccessible and making it a little bit more ugly to call um, actually has a material impact on how often folks end up using it. All right, how would we implement concat though? So here's one possible implementation of the concat uh, operation. We take a sequence of chunks as an argument. We sum all of the sizes of each constituent chunk. Uh, we allocate an array, and then we just copy all the elements in 
right? Sort of manipulating all the offsets. And in this case, since concat, right, we're gonna concatenate a bunch of individual chunks, we, we think it's a good idea to uh, keep concat as a uh, primitive backed, uh, you know, array. So we're gonna pick up the class tie constraint again. Let's see how we might use this concat operation to implement something maybe sort of complicated in FS2. Um, so here's this uncons n operation. Um, we're not going to get into all the details of this API. It's not particularly relevant. But I want to show just the way concat, the decision that we just made in the concat operation sort of impacts usage. So uncons n is a stream combinator. It says, given some stream s, um, take from it n values and then emit them sort of in a chunk. So we want to output this chunk of n values. And then we're also going to output the remaining uh, or the remainder of the input stream. And this pool data type is a, is a uh, functional data type that lets us recursively build up these stream computations. Um, and so, Typically, it looks something like this. You have like an internal recursive driver function. In this case, I called it go. Um, go is going to close over some state, in this case, like a, a queue of chunks, um, a stream that we're pulling from, and the number of remaining elements we're waiting on. And then it pulls on the source stream and says, give me the next chunk that's available in the source stream. And if we reach the end of the source stream, we, we reached it before coming up with our n elements. So we can just emit whatever we've got. We'll emit the concatenation of our accumulated chunk so far. And then our remainder stream is empty. If instead we got a chunk of elements from the source stream plus a tail plus the remaining remainder of the stream, um, then we want to sort of uh, you know, add that um, head chunk to our accumulator queue and recurse, okay? And if we reach the right number of elements, then we do some splitting and concatting, right? And then um, finally emit uh, the net result. Okay, so don't worry too much about that API. The important part is that in multiple cases, we called concat. And as we saw, concat requires this class tag constraint. And so we have some options on how we can address that. Um, to make that code compile, one option again is adding the class tag constraint to this generic O type parameter on the uncons n method. And if you do that, then all methods that call uncons n are going to need to pick up that same constraint. We're back to that viral propagation case we talked about earlier. Um, another option is to just change change the, the um, problem entirely, right? Rather than concatting, which is going to require this class tag constraint, what if we just emit our accumulator without concatting? We just give the, the queue of chunks back directly, right? Um, so sometimes it, it's um, difficult to see these types of options, right? We get so focused on the problem we're trying to solve, we don't realize we can just change the problem. Um, another option is we can remove the class tag constraint from concat, just like we did with map. So let's look at that third option. It seemed to work nice for map. Can we do it here? Um, and of course we can, right? It's the same exact trick. We allocate an array of any. We're going to, you know, trade off the fact that we, um, you know, we have this generic operation now, but we, we lose the ability to create these densely packed primitive arrays. Um, for an operation like concat, that sort of matters, right? Like if you're concatting a bunch of byte arrays together, you kind of want them to still be a byte array in the end, right? Not an object array. Uh, so this was, this was our attempt at fixing this a long time ago. Um, in essence, we, we sort of uh, taught chunks how to know what their element types were, like if we could just capture some, some knowledge at data construction time, saying like, oh, you put bytes in here, right? If we can then query that later and say like, hey, if someone wants to concat a bunch of chunks together, if we know that all of the chunks only contain bytes, 
then we can use an optimized version um, of concat that allocates a byte array. Right? And we, we could do that for each primitive type. And only if you put a non-primitive into a chunk, then we could fall back to the untagged based operate or you know approach. And the question, you know, with, with this type of approach is how do you do this efficiently? Like you don't want to do a linear scan over chunk. Um, and so we had a bunch of tricks. Like I said, we captured some witnesses at uh, construction time. There were some fallback cases for some of the other constructors. Um, it roughly worked. <sighs> Until we uh, started getting more adoption on Scala.js. In particular, the HTTP4S library, um, a functional Scala web library, um, got ported to Scala.js. And so you can do you know, uh, web servers in Node, um, you can do web clients, you can use it on uh, browser-based APIs, et cetera. Um, and that library uses FS2 as its underlying um, mechanism for moving bytes around. And so anyway, as Scala.js adoption increased, we eventually ran into this case where um, the, the uh, assumptions made in our implementation of this optimized concat no longer held. And in particular, because of Scala.js, uh, or sorry, because of uh, JavaScript's approach to like a number tower being different than the JVMs, we end up with operations like this, right? Where the, the number one is an instance of byte. And so the whole scheme we came up with um, didn't, didn't in fact work. So option three is out. We can't, we can't do the uh, untagged version and still get you know, specialized tagged behavior or efficient behavior in those cases. Um, so rather than falling back to option one or two, uh, we sort of combined options one and two. We said, well, what, what if we created a new data constructor for Chung? That's just a subtype of Q. Right? And so the idea is that the Chunk Q data constructor um, just references an underlying set of constituent chunks. And then you know, manipulates like a, a total constant time size operation as chunks are added or removed. Um, it can support appending a chunk or prepending a chunk. Um, we take care to make sure we don't put empty chunks into our constituent chunk queue, uh, just to um, preserve some uh, asymptotic complexity. And then indexing through this, you know, our efficient index-based lookup ends up just being uh, sort of a walk of our constituent chunk queue, right? Just looking for the right offset. And in fact, with this new data constructor, we can actually go back and add that plus plus operation, right? Because now that operation is no longer linear in the size of the input chunks. It's rather um, logarithmic in the size of the constituent chunk here. And we can use this new implementation in uncons n, and the trade-offs seem really good. Like our accumulator now is just a chunk of O. Like our output, you know, is the accumulator is just the same as our output type chunk of O. And in each of the cases throughout the code where before we were um, calling concat, right? Now we're just emitting our accumulated chunk. Um, and, in, and when we want to add elements to that, we're just concatenating that chunk, right? So we're just hiding all of that um, underlying Q manipulation. But all is not well. There's one big problem here, uh, and it's in the asymptotic runtime performance of that index-based lookup on Q-based chunks, right? When the constituent chunk Q is small, then we have effectively constant time uh, runtime performance, right? If there's only like two or three elements in that constituent chunk Q, and when you go and look up an index, it's real quick to kind of jump through them and say, what's the size of the first one? What's the size of the second one? Oh, your target index must be in the third. Right? But as that constituent chunk queue size approaches n, 
Or another way to say that is that as the size of the individual constituent chunks approach one, um, then our runtime performance is now linear, right? Because each of those bounds checks really just moves you over one element. Um, and now let's go back to our for each, our, you know, one of our fundamental um, building block operations that we use in all of our other combinations. If apply can be linear in some cases, then for each is quadratic, right? Because for each is already linear in and of itself. Um, we're gonna say each time through that loop, we're, we're potentially making a linear operation for apply. That's not good. Um, and so we can fix for each, and we can fix for each with index real easily, right? We can say, well, just don't index. Um, like we can specialize the definition of for each on the Q constructor to say, you have no need to index in this case, just for each over each of the elements in the constituent chunk queue. And that works fine. That works great. But any other combinators that were implemented with apply um, still have this potential for, um, for nasty asymptotic performance. So how do we fix that? Uh, this was an idea from a, a co-maintainer of FS2. Um, the, the general idea here is that we're just going to binary search an index table. Okay. Um, so let me show you what I mean. Um, here, if our, our constituent chunk queue is five elements with these sizes, size 3, 10, 1, so on, um, we want to build this lookup table of accumulated sizes. And say um, the, the accumulated size uh, after the first element is three, and after the second element is 13, and then 14, and so on. And then we'll also create an array um, that references each of these elements in the queue. And then we will binary search this accumulated sizes array um, for the target index. Right? So in this case, if we binary search this array for 20, we start at 14, we move over to 34, and now we know um, <clears throat> that the target element is in this position. Right? So we can move up to here, and we say the target element is in here. And so the implementation of that is shown here, um, both the creation of this um, set of lookup tables, as well as all of the sort of um, index arithmetic needed to binary search it and then do the, the appropriate lookup. Um, feel free to take Excuse a look me? at the slides. If you... Go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, just a gentle reminder that we are in the last three minutes of the session. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and so uh, the, the net result of that um, implementation is that the first call to apply is linear in the number of constituent chunks. But all subsequent calls to apply are logarithmic in the number of constituent chunks and chunks. So with this implementation, even in the worst case where you have a chunk queue of singleton elements, um, that for each implementation, for example, the one that used uh, index-based lookup would have been uh, n log n instead of uh, quadratic. Okay. So in the, in the parting moments here, um, I just wanted to say that we made a lot of compromises on our initial definition of what a chunk was, right? Um, and those compromises are okay. Um, you know, we, we traded off all of these sort of um, hard constraints that we started with for good reasons. I mean, I think that's something we have to remind ourselves in functional programming is that um, we gotta look for those balances and find the, the right approach. Um, I don't want you to leave this talk thinking this, that design is the series of logical decisions that we just walked through, right? Rather, this was years of accreted knowledge uh, based off of all sorts of use cases. Um, so this is like a, over like a five-year period. There's over 20 issues and pull requests just manipulating chunks. Um, and so that, that's really my talk for today. Um, you know, I'm happy to take questions maybe in the, the hangout area. Um, but in general, I hope that's an interesting walk through sort of the design process that we went through 
even for a relatively simple data set. Um, what a message to leave us through design is uh, an iterative process of success and failures. You'll remember that. Um, thanks a lot for the wonderful time, Michael.